Every story begins with a lie. When my father passed, I wanted nothing more than my mother's happiness. Phil manages the cattle ranch with his brother, George. Notice his confident walk. He refuses to eat when asked. In fact, the first thing he does when he comes in from working the cattle ranch is he picks up the thing he loves most in the world and starts to play. The first time we see George, Phil's brother, he's naked in the bathtub. The impression Campion, the director, gives is that George is infantile, incapable of working hard, often vulnerable, and unused to hard work. He's what you might call middle management and not much else. Throughout the entire movie, we never see him dirty. In this scene, he asks Phil if he ever thinks about using the house bath, giving us the impression that Phil never bathes. In fact, in just about every one of Phil's scenes throughout the two-hour movie, he is unwashed. This is symbolic of his independence and contempt for conformity. When we meet Rose for the first time, she is sweeping the dining hall of her inn. Peter is upstairs putting together paper flowers. We see Rose is content, humming, barely acknowledging the man who tells her how many work hands will be at the inn for dinner and what they prefer to eat. She is happy in her station to serve the hungry men, working behind the scenes, keeping her small inn clean and tidy. She knows her role and her place and is happy to be of use in this world. She understands her world, its simple expectations of her, and this makes her feel safe and happy. She admires her son's artistic nature and leafs through his album. Although banal and random, the album seems to please her. In this scene, she comments how the mansion is too big to clean, and he says, you wouldn't have to clean it, there would be a cleaner. This shows us that he has aspirations for a better life for himself and his mother. She admires the cleverness of his paper flowers. Rose represents the working class. She walks with a heavy gait and stiff and simple aspirations indicate she is happiest when she is being of use. Her son represents the next generation and as stated in the voiceover at the beginning of the film, the goal is to protect the working class to keep their lives happy and uncomplicated. This is a metaphor for control and wielding power over them. With the flowers as the central point, they become the pivot into the unspoken tensions that end up peppering the movie. In this scene, we see Phil mocking Peter's flowers. This leads us to believe that Phil is mocking Peter's feminine, creative nature, but Phil seems to be more focused on the fact that the flowers are fake providing a subtle insight into his disdain of man's mimicry of the natural world. When Phil mocks Peter's lisp, the tension in this scene is the class position. Despite the fact that Phil is sitting and Peter is standing over him and the crew, Phil has the upper hand as he orders Peter to get them some food. This scene indicates a power play, where Peter is once again reminded of his place in the world, a servant. Yet, because of his standing position, Campion gives us insight into the future of Peter and Phil and where the movie is going. A character we never meet but is necessary to provide depth and characterization to Phil and his ranch hands is Bronco Henry. Bronco Henry is often referred to in reverent tones as a Kierkegaard-like character who could achieve great physical feats and is seen as an almost mystical person of folklore and inspiration. Without the guidance of Bronco Henry and Phil's repeating of his teachings, the men would be lost. 
Bronco Henry, although only spoken of in the past tense, is actually the character that binds the men to Phil, the work, the animals, and the world around them. In this story, that world is 1920s Montana. But it's in this scene when Phil is lost in memory and is rehashing a tale of Bronco Henry that he picks up one of Peter's paper flowers and without thinking, uses it to light his cigarette. It's when he extinguishes it in the water that we see how Phil gets lost in reverie and the golden world of life with Bronco Henry. Lost in sentimentality of the past and not paying attention to how this small act might affect Peter is what ultimately leads to Phil's demise. Rose returns to retrieve the flowers off the table, yet she is invisible to Phil and the ranch hands. This further cements the idea of class divide and the invisibility of the servant class. At the end of this scene, the gap between Phil and his brother is clearly drawn as Phil invites George into the conversation, but George has no clue or understanding of what Phil is even talking about. George sees the world through his simplistic, pampered view, and the shocked, humiliated look on Phil's face signals to us that he's probably never understood his brother, and yet his brother, who is so much less than him, still has the ability to undermine him in front of the men. This emotional tension carries the scene and leads us into a deeper understanding of Phil's contempt for the banality of the world around him as he demands the man joking around on the player piano shut it down. For someone like Phil, who has a deep love of authentic music, there is nothing worse than a player piano, which is nothing more than a mockery of the gift of music. This angry outburst immediately changes the tone of the dining hall and sets the pivot for tensions in the movie as it further highlights the unspoken rift between the brothers. In this scene, Phil and George meet for lunch at home. Notice the invisibility of the servant and notice how Phil refuses to eat. This aperture of the miniaturized desk and chair provides clear focus not only of Phil's disdain for office work, but on his diagnosing George's small-mindedness and lack of vision. The small furniture also indicates the minuscule nature of George's choices because unfortunately, this small power play gets undermined as George announces that he has married Rose. This surprises Phil and further demonstrates that not only does George hold his brother's world and life and the possibility of disrupting it with very little regard, but it also feels like an act of revenge. As Rose and George are traveling to the mansion together, Rose insists she is not a very good piano player when George recommends she play for the governor and his wife and his parents who are visiting soon. This scene introduces the pivot into Rose's fate, traveling away from her own successful business, which she sold to marry George, she realizes subconsciously that she is losing her independence. She then suggests they pull over to picnic. And attempts to teach George a small dance. We hear him say, I can't, I really can't dance. Yet she is there for him encouraging him and they end up dancing on the side of the mountain her good nature love of beautiful things and perseverance serves her well and she gains her confidence back even beginning to hum the little tune she would hum back at the inn suddenly george releases her and walks away from her confusing her he looks pained and even angry and frustrated a child unable to articulate his words. When she asks him what is wrong and he responds how nice it is not to be alone, what he's really saying is that he's glad he no longer has to be alone to live with his brother, who outshines him and outperforms him in every way. Rose's mastery of the dance triggered George's feelings of inadequacy with his brother 
And when she started to demonstrate that same talent and find herself again, he had to cut that off and bring her down to his simple, ordinary level, dragging her potential down into his vapid, empty world is what ultimately leads her down a path of despair and solitude and the banality of his world. Juxtaposing the beauty of nature and the wide open space of the road in the last scene against the cold, brutal masculinity of the room in this scene alienates the viewer from the idea of a recently joined married couple. The first formal introduction between Phil and Rose He barely acknowledges her, holding his hands behind his back, his shadowy figure barking out a message to his brother. His hands tightly clasped are symbolic of something we see later in the film, when his injured hand is ultimately what does him in. By holding them behind his back, Campion is warning us, illustrating how Phil is protecting his life force, the source of all his power, As we will see later, he uses his hands as tools of raw power and sensual exploration of his private world. In this scene, Rose attempts a nicety, but when he refuses to acknowledge it and calls her a cheap schemer, she drops the pretense. This is symbolized as she drops her bouquet of white roses and lets them dangle in front of her. Her husband, having abandoned her to take care of the trivial creature comforts, such as fixing the furnace, that Phil simply waves away as unimportant. Phil's disdain of Rose isn't because he believes she is there to take advantage of the family wealth, but because as someone who lives life by his own rules and doesn't compromise on his own ideals, he is contemptuous that she gave up a life of happy, simple independence to disrupt his. Earlier in the film, Phil mentions to George twice they'd been running the ranch for 25 years together, and George seemed to have nothing to say to Phil in response to that. As Phil listens to George lock his brother out of his life, and embrace married life, and for the first time in two decades, the two brothers aren't sharing a room. The sense of abandonment washes over Phil. He feels betrayed that the parents went ahead and let George elope with Rose, despite Phil's attempts to sabotage the union. He feels he is being left behind as George and his bride move forward in their new life, which is symbolic of the modern world that is just around the corner and he is distrustful of Rose as she makes her claim on the ranch, his legacy, and the future of the Burbank name. The key turning in the lock is a startling, cold act of being locked out of something, locked away and locked down. Phil is frightened and vulnerable and goes to the only place he can find comfort, the past. Phil decides to leave the house and go into the barn to oil Bronco Henry's old saddle, which is kept as a shrine of sorts. We can see his deep love of Bronco Henry as he lovingly caresses and cares for the saddle, and we are introduced into something far more sacred than just a love affair between men. This scene pivots into the secret world of the sensual and sacred that Campion is famous for, something rarely seen in films these days. As Phil crawls through his private makeshift tunnel of tree branches and leaves, a rite of passage, so to speak, birthing from one realm to another, this is symbolic of his emergence as a mythical being in the wild, where all male energy and masculinity is transformed into something erotic and musical. And a playful dance between the sublime and peaceful tranquility of nature tugs at the earthly necessity of the ritualistic passage from the profane to the sacred. The mud is a purifier and covering his body, he then jumps into the water and becomes one with nature, one with the earth and water and the creatures that over time have made him whole and who he is. Rose breaks away from her status as newly appointed lady of the house 
and bored out of her mind, inserts herself back into the realm of the servant class, insisting she remain invisible by cajoling the staff to keep talking as she busies herself in the kitchen. But like clockwork, this comforting, useful place that she enjoys is disrupted when she discovers her husband has purchased her a baby grand piano. She explains once again she is only an average piano player and the instrument is too good for her. Her concern that she may humiliate her husband in front of the governor and his parents is evident as she makes feeble attempts to practice. Embarrassed at her lack of talent, she shuts herself off from the rest of the house, making sure all the doors are closed so no one can hear her struggling to play. But Phil sneaks in and taunts her from above, reminding her of her status, her minimal talent, and yet he is threatened by her. And through his mastery of the banjo, we see the realization dawn on Rose that this is it for the rest of her life. A constant, almost flirtatious power play between herself and Phil, where he will always be there to remind her of her mistakes and bad choices while attempting to undermine her predetermined role at the ranch. This discovery is palpable as Rose escapes outdoors and looks back at the house in an incredulous manner. She realizes that no matter how much she practices, she will never be able to master the talent and exquisite sounds that Phil can, as he makes an old banjo sound like the baby grand itself. All that is missing in her life, passion, color, a deep resonating oneness with the world and all its majestic wonder and secrets is lost. And this loss is profoundly apparent as she allows the realization of all of this and her new role to swallow her whole. Having sabotaged Rose's confidence, Phil takes the upper hand. He is galled and offended when his brother asks him to wash up and come to dinner to meet with the governor and his wife and their parents. It's clear Phil has been pushed aside in favor of Rose, and now everyone wants him at the party. He is further offended when he realizes this is George's way of saying, we want the parts of you that work for us, but not all of you, if you know what I mean. This angers Phil, so he leaves his replacement, Rose, twisting. When George goes to meet his parents to take them to the house and the mother asks if there is anyone else with him, she means Phil, but instead she must make do with Rose. In the midst of the snobbishness of the upper and educated class, Rose is made to feel like nothing more than a servant as her new mother-in-law disdainfully turns away a drink, claiming, I'm not going to drink one of George's concoctions. The governor makes a comment about Phil graduating top of his class and even jokes, does he swear to the cattle in Greek or Latin? This joke gives insight into the governor who, despite his status, is also a simpleton. Without Phil, the party is basically a dud. Even George tries to apologize earlier when he finds Phil in the barn smoking and says, we need your conversation. Phil knows he's the smartest and most talented in any room and that he alone is the reason the ranch is so successful. In his mind, it's an unforgivable act of sabotage to replace him with Rose. Without Phil, Rose is forced to take over the role of entertainer and is pressured to play piano for the guests. She suffers terrible stage fright and is already intimidated, marrying into a class she was not born into and is too nervous to play. When Phil finally does show up, he downplays his superior intelligence by acting like a hasty, purposefully mispronouncing words, and he comes as he always has, conforming to no one's demands, and uses the fact that he hasn't bathed as an excuse not to shake hands or get too close. 
His mother is quietly shocked at this, and his long, lingering, contemptuous gaze on her as he slowly bites into an apple is an edible tension channeling Freud onto celluloid as only Campion can master. It's at this point that we pivot into the cementing of Rose's despair who was reminded by Phil, of course, that playing a cheap piano at the pictures is no dinner party for the governor. She is also reminded of her new role and how none of them will be able to make the ranch a success without Phil. Phil knows this, and by removing himself from the party, makes himself more valuable. The pressure of this is too much for Rose, who for the first time in her life takes a drink of alcohol and begins her spiral into alcoholism and despair. It's during this first half of the movie that Phil's character is richly defined. He is a Zen master of sorts, and his caustic nature is more about shaping the people around him as a master would than simply being a nonconformist. Even when playing his banjo on the second floor, his mastery of the instrument and the message it sent to Rose to inspire her to reach deeper understandings of herself and to warn her of her fate should she stay in the house was the same practice a Zen master would use, using a kaisaku to rouse a sleeping monk or used as a warning stick to guide. Phil's playing of a humble banjo to Rose spoke these clear, endearing terms. The cattle drivers and ranch hands look up to Phil as a master. Despite his lofty education and superior intellect, he humbles himself as a workhand and teaches them the art of skinning hides and animal husbandry and the ways of the ranch. He is a guide, and his rough, seemingly selfish exterior itself is the guide. He often talks about the teachings and the ways of Bronco Henry in the same way traditional Zen masters would repeat the allegories and teachings of their own masters, passing down the tradition of a spoken allegory or message to teach lessons of enlightenment. And the filth was only a symbol of that Zen master status to set him apart from the privileged class and yet keep him humble and relatable among his men as all good leaders do. Up until this point, the film has been honest. Despite George's flat absence of novelty and despite Rose's simple status as being an in-owner cooking and caring for her guests and despite the strange power play of the governor and his wife and George and Phil's snobbish mother and despite Phil himself with his wild, untamed ways, his open disdain for the banal, his secretive nature in nature, there has been an honesty, an honest telling of the characters. In this scene, even with Phil's back to the camera, we can see that his time has come to an end in the world, and the old guard is wondering what will come of their legacy. It's at this pivot, when Peter comes back into the film, that Campion begins to reveal the lie and the insidious nature of calculated lies that act as cover for a conceivable truth and mask illusions that harbor in the minds of these aforementioned characters. They have never seen this before, this new version of a generation they helped create. They have only seen hard work, whimsy, education, judgment, and privilege. They have never seen a calculated, homicidal sociopath in their midst. They have never met an individual interested in dissecting life and trying to understand it by tearing it apart in order to benefit from it, rather than living it and having experience shape it to new depths and understanding. It's in this scene that we learn Peter chooses to keep his father's medical books with him at the boarding school. Notice Peter's choice of the white hat 
He states at the beginning of the movie that his goal was to be a hero to his mother. And of course, the white hat represents that goal. And he ignores her when she asks if he's eating, which links him to Phil somehow, this lack of eating. Instead, he talks about an invisible character we only hear of once, his friend, who calls him doctor and who he calls professor. This new generation has removed the human element from their growth into adulthood because, as he states, they call themselves that because that's what they want to be. We also see him picking up and choosing a pair of white shoes. Later on in the film, Phil suggests Peter wear better footwear like boots. The white shoes represent the new generation's attitude toward work. They will benefit from the work without ever getting their feet dirty. White shoes also represent a term that is used to describe prestigious professional service firms that have traditionally been associated with the upper class elite, usually white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who graduated from Ivy League colleges. The term is most often used to describe leading law firms and Wall Street financial institutions, as well as accounting firms that are over a century old. Peter's choice of white shoes is one of the most obvious and overt forms of symbolism in the film. We can learn so much from this interaction. Peter is not from the East Coast, yet his goal is to attend school to become a doctor and is probably influenced by his peers at boarding school. He also is resistant to bringing his friend to the ranch because he doesn't want his friend to see Phil, who is most likely leagues beyond them in intelligence and talent, and as we learn later, a graduate of Yale, which means Phil could influence him into reshaping how he grows into the capitalist he will eventually become. From here on out, we never see the parents or the governor again, but this scene is crucial to pivot the story, especially when the ranch hand asks Phil why he doesn't wear gloves. The mention of the gloves is our first clue. The gloves play a decisive role in peeling away the nature of characters we may have felt sympathetic toward in the first part of the film. It is at this point that Campion uses more symbolism in her film to represent an allegory of the foreboding coming of the modernization of man. Phil is telling George how many cattle have been castrated, and as soon as he says, I think we're finished, George doesn't say thank you or well done. He simply takes what he needs to show profit in the books, then turns his back on Phil to meet with Rose and Peter. In this scene, Peter comes out in white shoes, but he's removed his white hat. He wants to look vulnerable in front of Phil, who is announcing the rules of the ranch. Nothing is allowed to be sold, including hides, and he warns of animals that want to kill their own. He looks right at Peter as he says this, showing his distrust of Peter and his intentions. But Peter knows Phil is already disdainful of him, so he wants to play up that disdain by coming outside just as a boy playing with the dog. Phil demonstrates his control of the situation by showing his power over the dog by whistling a dog command, and also allows his men to taunt Peter by circling him with their horses to run him off. This is a power play and Peter gives Phil the illusion that he has the upper hand. Peter, who we are led to believe is just a sensitive boy who likes to make paper flowers and read his father's medical books, somehow is able to set a trap and catch a rabbit in the wild, even though he doesn't know the first thing about trapping or working the land, or so we are led to believe up until this point. He dons his white hat once again, illustrating his hero's intent as he offers his now alcoholic mother the gift of the rabbit and watches with little emotional investment as it brings her a moment of joy in her otherwise constant inebriated state. <laughs> 
In between, the young servant girl hoping to feed the rabbit a carrot, only to discover Peter had dissected it for some reason. We also learn from the other kitchen maid how progress is rolling over the dead by putting in a highway over a graveyard. This scene illustrates the calculated horror of modernization, often propelled by machinery that upsets graveyards or machine-like boys who rip apart living things to better understand them. But as the kitchen maid goes on into great detail about how human hair continues to grow long after the body is dead, this illustrates the resilience of the natural world despite man's attempts to destroy it. In this scene, Rose asks Peter to play tennis with her, and he says, I have a lot to do. What does a boy who goes to boarding school and is only home for the summer actually have to do? She asked him why he killed the rabbit, and he answers honestly that if he wants to be a surgeon, he's going to have to practice. She says he's not allowed to kill them in the house, and he responds nonchalantly, where would a man be if he always did what his mother told him? This is the first time he refers to Rose as mother. The second time in the movie is when he asks her if she's all right later in the scene. The fact that this conversation takes place over a game of tennis illustrates the rare moment of combative form that we never see between Rose and Peter. Peter is becoming his own person and winning and allowing Rose to believe she's still part of the game of shaping his life. He even tells Lola not to announce the score, that he's keeping track of it in his head. It's at this point that we see how Rose's alcoholism has taken control over her life as her body starts to go into withdrawal, just as she witnesses Phil and becomes agitated. This is symbolic of the new, still having to deal with the old, and Phil, symbolic of the old way, carefully places his relics of the past, his arrowheads, in his cabinet as he taunts Rose from above. The ever-present past taunting its authority and superiority over the future, which is weak and ill-prepared for the modernizing world. In this scene, we see Phil at his most vulnerable, where he pulls a piece of cloth from his satchel and allows his body to feel its softness and his hands are again illustrated as tools of sensuality as he playfully folds the cloth in his fingers while holding it in the sunlight lounging in the grass. The cloth acts as a source of security and connection for Phil. The cloth represents our connections with our past and our often distorted romantic versions and visions of the past, and the allure it holds over us, blinding us to what is happening in the present. This is illustrated as we see the portion of the cloth softly pulled over Phil's face and eyes, stitched with the initials BH for Bronco Henry. Phil's obsession with Bronco Henry and the past is blinding him to the present. When Peter happens upon Phil's private sanctuary, what we witness is this idea that the future hero, with another trapped rabbit clutched in its hand, needs to master the world in order to undermine it. This discovery of Phil's secret stash is what's important, not the stash itself. Whether it's adult literature or magazines or a secret stash of guns, the fact is, is that it's a portal into Phil's nature and a glimpse into what makes him tick. And we see Peter no longer wearing his hat. The satchel left behind somewhere has now become the boy again, simply exploring this new world of man in his agrarian state. But Peter's sociopathic and scientific nature can never fully embrace or understand the human form the same way Phil can. Peter would prefer to dissect it and rip it apart to understand it, whereas Phil revels in the form itself and all its strength. This scene transitions us into the next and is just as necessary as Phil's secret tunnel of leaves and tree branches are symbolic of the birth of the spirit of man. We travel through into the darkest corners of Peter's mind and the birthing process of this 
is a subtle but necessary transition as we understand how the future of progress undermines our human spirit and the traditions of the past. When the family arrives at the camp where the ranch hands are resting, we see Rose has now fully integrated into her role as leading lady. Her stylish white hat, her expensive pink silk machine made western blouse, and even her gloves signify her embodiment of her new class as the boss's wife. Peter, also in his hero's white hat, seems to perform a catwalk for the men as they taunt and whistle at him. He is unfazed, though, as he watches the magpies in the nest above, then carefully looks down at the ground at something. Perhaps a chick has fallen from the nest. Magpies are birds that often invade other birds' nests. They are the most important symbol in this scene as we watch George, Rose, and Peter descend into the makeshift camp that Phil and the ranch hands are lounging in and resting, as if these three in their fancy attire and white hats were the magpies taking over another bird's nest. When Phil calls Peter over, we see a flash of concern on Rose's face, not because she is concerned her effeminate son will be lured into a romance, but because she doesn't want him meeting with Phil. As part of new management, she doesn't want him to be lulled into nostalgia or learn the old ways of the ranch. We also see that Peter has made his decision to derisively and roundly dismiss Phil by refusing to call him by his first name, and he stands authoritatively over him. In theater, when one character stands over another, even if there is no dialogue between the characters, the message is that one person has a higher rank or station or class than the other simply by the position of his body. In performances of Greek mythology, it is often the actors who portray the role of the gods that are never seen sitting, only standing in all of their scenes. By refusing to call Phil by his first name, we take this as a sort of a reversal in respect when the younger generation refuses to use first names and only refer to their elders as their surnames in a mocking tone. It's not until we see the rope and Phil makes a great effort to humble himself with Peter that we see a shift in Peter's choice and attitude toward Phil. He sees the rope and Phil's vulnerability as an opportunity. When Peter entered the scene, he entered with his mother and George as a station higher than the rest. Ignoring the catcalling of the ranch hands in the same way he and his mother were often ignored when they would serve these very ranch hands back at the inn in their former life. Campion lures us into a false sense of security as Peter bends his knee, removes his hero's hat in one sweeping gesture, and becomes the boy again, eager to be taught by the master. But when he learns that the rope will be finished before he goes back to school, he stands back up, ranking himself above Phil, places his hat on his head, and the hero states, well, that won't be very long now, Phil. This is the new, modernized way of working the ranch, saying, your old ways are nearly done, and as soon as you're done weaving this rope, it will be over for you. In a classic move that only sociopaths can master, they take the information they need by pretending to endear themselves to their prey. At the end of this scene, the smirk seen on Peter's face is fuzzy as the camera focuses in on Rose's anguish, another director's trick to keep us distracted from exposing the supposed innocent victim as the true villain. The marigolds symbolize a feeling of despaired love, and we open this scene with Rose planting marigolds along the side of the house, symbolizing her despair of the loss of her old life, where she was happy and not tormented by alcohol or what is forging between Peter and Phil and the daunting task of what it means to replace the old ways of the ranch. She is not concerned about any sexual tensions or romantic entanglement between her son and Phil. She is concerned because she doesn't understand it or her son or even her own feelings towards Phil. 
Her conscience is unsettling her, but her alcoholism and her despair cloud her intuition and even the truth about herself and her new role. The director of the film leads us to believe the mother is anguished at losing her child to the lures of a handsome cowboy, pulling him into a darkened barn, teaching him the ways of the saddle. But when Phil reprimands Peter not to let his mother make a sissy out of him, the director is again leading us to believe that Peter is in any way controlled by his mother. Phil believes it's Rose who wants Peter to wear the white shoes, when it's actually Peter himself who has chosen the shoes to symbolize his future. But Peter lets Phil believe it's his mother who chooses the shoes, which leads the audience to wonder what other lies is Peter allowing Phil to believe about himself. When Phil suggests they go out together on an adventure, assuming the student would be eager to learn from the master, Peter ignores it completely and asks if any cattle ever get attacked by wolves. Phil offers significant information to Peter that ultimately leads to his death. Sometimes the cattle die of anthrax or a black leg. Phil then describes Peter's sociopathic nature by saying, you know, you talk like a Victrola record. When Peter says, I didn't know that, Phil says, yeah, but you do. He knows that the boy is missing the part that makes him relatable. Phil then describes how Bronco Henry taught him to see things in the hillside. And when he asks Peter what he supposes that is, Peter nonchalantly states, it's a barking dog. This shocks Phil, and he is incredulous to find a soulless boy shares the same creative vision and interpretations as a man he reveres and looks upon with great love and passion, and who shares his own vision of the hillside is too unbelievable for him to accept. It's at this point that Phil's vulnerability toward believing everything he is told that forces the audience to reconcile with their preconceived notions of the character. Phil is far too gullible and blind to the fact that if Peter shares the vision, then that can only mean he can also replace him. When the drunken Rose brings her son into her room, he immediately starts strumming his comb, which acts as his fidget spinner or his device to stay focused. It's what he does when she attempts to get close to him. She speaks of how a teacher in the past would write chalkboard stars by their name. And when she wonders why she would do that, he says, because stars are supposed to be unreachable. She tries to reach him by asking him if there is a song that makes him shiver, but he says he doesn't remember and pushes her away when she shows him affection. He is then seen quickly leafing through a book of injured body parts the camera quickly focuses on a sketch of an injured hand. He seems impatient and frustrated, and a quick sense of urgency seems to flicker across his face as he flips through the book, clicks his comb, and makes a discovery. This scene illustrates that other people's emotions or dysfunction often distract us from our own goals. In Peter's case, he wants to be a surgeon and feels a sense of urgency in discovering the function of a human body, or in this particular case, the injuries on the body, his mother's emotional needs, and as we see later, her need for him to be a part of the running of the ranch got in the way of his goal. The comical way in which Peter is riding and falls over leads the audience to believe he's putting on a show for Phil and the ranch hands. Perhaps Phil knows he's acting, because when one of the ranchers offers to ride out and help, Phil says, don't, let him figure it out. We then see Peter packing something in a napkin, which we assume to be lunch, and follow a trail on his own. He smells something malodorous and follows the smell. He is decisive in his goal, and he seems pretty adept at riding. If he weren't, he wouldn't be able to lead the horse down the steep side of a ravine 
He then dismounts, and we see a dead cow. This is the only time we see Peter in cowboy boots instead of his white shoes. He dons surgical gloves, symbolizing a hidden task at hand, and removes his tools from the napkin and begins to cut away at the dead animal with the black leg, or as we learned earlier, anthrax. When Rose sees Peter and Phil ride off together alone, she breaks down and we see a glimpse into the truth about what's happening with her. She knows her son is unreachable and not like an ordinary human being. In this scene, she cries out, I don't want him to be with Phil at all. She doesn't say she doesn't want Phil to be with Peter, as we would suspect a mother protective of her son would say, not wanting the son to be with someone she doesn't trust. Instead, she focuses her energy on Phil. With a very slight switch in perspective, we can see Rose has probably realized over time that Phil is not who she thought, and that Peter, her own flesh and blood, is also not who she thought. Her intuition must sense that something is amiss as she watches them ride off together, but alcoholism, confusion, depression, and despair has kept her from seeing things clearly. But Rose, knowing she is to take the place of Phil, cannot run the ranch in the modern way expected of her. She needs her son to usher in the future of the ranch, and watching him ride off with Phil was as if watching her own future slip away from her. When Peter and Phil are alone together planting stakes at the far end of the field, a wild rabbit runs under a pile of wood. Phil removes the wood, Peter grabs the rabbit, and Phil notices the rabbit's leg is broken, so he mentions it's going to have to be put out of its misery. Peter, lulling the rabbit into a false sense of security before he snaps its neck, leaves an impression on Phil, who doesn't notice that his hand is bleeding profusely, symbolizing the beginning of his decline. As agrarian society in the United States falls away, and industrial capitalism takes over and moves in, causing environmental issues with the land, and diseases not seen before pepper the landscape, in the same way we see the introduction of cars peppering the wide open spaces in Montana in the film, seemingly as peripheral add-ons, but not integral to the cattle ranch itself, but still there and noticeable, we see the beginnings of the end of an old way of life. The managing of farms and ranches in the open is now reshaped and reframed through the interaction between worker and manager. The necessity of learning the trade first by hand is no longer valued and no longer lends itself to success as it once did. The injury to Phil's hand symbolizes the death of the old ways of how ranches were run and it wasn't accidental. Calculated and premeditated to make way for capitalism, this grotesque truth is beautifully but bluntly depicted as we see the blood spatter on the windswept shafts of grass. Phil and Peter share a moment as Phil talks about Rose's alcoholism, which doesn't seem to faze Peter at all. He explains his mother never used to drink, which leads Phil to the conclusion that Peter's dad probably did drink. If paying attention to Rose's behavior, we can opine that Peter's father may have beat Rose. She walks stiffly in her alcoholic state, as if always on edge, ready to flinch, in a sort of learned behavior. So perhaps, when Peter's father drank, he became violent with her. We also know that she was happiest when she was running the inn on her own after her husband's death. When Peter talks about finding his father had hung himself and how he had to cut the body down, he says his father used to say he wasn't kind enough and that he was too strong. This shocks Phil, who has been totally bamboozled by Peter at this point, believing the boy to be the victim and stating that things will work out for him yet. What Peter's father was describing were the traits of a sociopath. Phil values authenticity above all, and at this point has allowed Peter to best him, unaware that he is actually his adversary. He has let his guard down, believing the boy's admission of his father's apparent suicide has entrusted him to Peter. For all of Phil's sophistication and wisdom, he is unschooled in the ways of deception. 
He is only accustomed to people presenting themselves as they are, with all of their flaws, flaunting those flaws back at them. Their openness has made them easily understood, but Peter is a new kind of creature never encountered before. He is secretive, plotting, and hidden, and Phil is incapable of seeing beyond what he is presented with. When Rose discovers Phil's seemingly absurd rule of burning his hides instead of sharing them with the Indians, she makes a huge spectacle of chasing them down, drawing unnecessary attention to herself and embarrassing herself. What she's doing at this point is attempting to take charge of the ranch. Phil is on his way out and he's still asserting his old ways, which don't make any sense to her or to George, but he's still in control of the operations. She makes an even bigger fool of herself announcing to the Indians that her husband owns the land, land that was obviously stolen from the Native Americans in the first place, which is a tried and true trope of capitalism. We own it so we can make the rules, and these are the new rules. So she begs them to take the hides, putting on airs as a woman of great compassion. This overzealous act of altruism and liberal compassion is a humiliating spectacle, and as a token of their appreciation, the Indians give her a pair of gloves, which look more like party favors upon closer inspection. She is overly emotional with gratitude. The Indians themselves appear to have assimilated well enough. They dress in present day garb and have no indication they hold on to any traditional ways, whether by choice or by force. We can only assume what Phil's reasons are for not trading with these Native Americans, but because he's been running the ranch for over 25 years, his reasons are his own. The gloves again act as a symbol of the hidden motives of the modernization and changing of the guard. Rose faints in her nightgown, her husband carries her to safety, and finding the bottle of alcohol in her bed, promptly pours the bottle's contents down the sink. She clutches the gloves as a child would clutch a favorite toy. It's at this point that we finally see George take control of the situation. She needs help, and George has to be the one to help her. Rose is to replace Phil, and George must help her along with this transfer of power. When the brothers confront one another, George explains that Rose is sick and needs help, making excuses for her going against Phil's rules and giving the highs away. Phil is inconsolable, desperate to remain in control of his land, his hides, everything, and he is angered that he was undermined. Keeping with George's lack of interest in Phil, as we've seen throughout the entire film, he refuses to engage in conflict. Throughout the entire film, we see that it's the lack of conflict and the lack of sparring that causes the banality of the world to encroach and choke the life out of Phil and the ranch. Without conflict, one can't have progress, and over time, conflict has been bred out of George. He has simply disengaged with his brother like a middle manager would, using his talent to keep the ranch successful, but never acknowledging Phil's talent or the conflict that may come with it. For instance, the work it takes to remove the hides from the animal, then hang them, and then use them to continue to make his rope for his own personal project, doesn't even matter to George, who walks away from Phil after apologizing. This outburst and highly tense display seems to agitate Peter, who is pacing in front of his own strips of hide he had cut from the dead cow on the trail. He quietly removes his glove and touches Phil tenderly on the arm, offering him the strips of his own hide that he has been drying. He says what Phil most wants to hear when Phil is at his most vulnerable. I want it to be like you, he said, and Phil is overcome with gratitude and emotion and tells Peter that everything's going to be plain sailing for him from now on in. Again, we see him prophetically announcing the end of his role at the ranch. His brother has taken it upon himself to turn away and tend to his wife and give her the care she needs, and Phil is left alone 
to hold on to the last remnants of the old ways. The Zen master is dying and must defer to the student for help, indebted to the student's duplicitous act of kindness and compassion after watching George, his own brother, become more and more distant over the years. The last lucid moment in Phil's life was when he was making his rope, talking with Peter in the barn about how Bronco Henry kept him alive by lying side by side with him when he was dying. Once again, the lure of a sentimental past clouds his judgment as he continues to weave the story along with the weaving of the rope, as if the rope itself intertwined into his own memories of life, love, and loss. The last time we see Phil, he is a shell of himself. He's feverish and unable to tie his own shoes or even walk with confidence. It's the first time we see him in a suit as his brother has offered to take him to the doctor. Throughout the entire film up until this point, we have only ever seen Phil in chaps and his cowboy attire, the pinnacle of health and virility. He must know that something is wrong and that he's been poisoned because he briefly casts a gaze on Rose and dismisses her as he leaves the house for the last time. He takes his finished rope and tries to find Peter to give it to him, but Peter is hiding from him. At the beginning of the film, we saw Phil through a picture window, confident and in control. And now he is in that same window, as if the car rolling along behind him, driven by George, is pushing him out of the frame. He is now an irrelevant relic of the past, being carried away by an automobile, a modern invention, to be buried and forgotten. Later, at the funeral, the doctor explains that Phil died of anthrax poisoning, and George states that that's impossible because Phil never handled diseased animals and was very particular about that. At the funeral, George's mother gives Rose a handful of jewelry, symbolizing that Rose is now not only part of the family, but that she holds all of its precious resources in her hands. The matriarchy has been passed on to her, and with this comes wealth and status, a foreshadowing that it will be her line through Peter that will take over the running of the ranch and modernize it. This is symbolic of the corporate takeover of American agriculture, the siphoning off of family land to indifferent, banal, cold, corporate interests that have no real history with the land itself. When George mentions to his father that Rose would like them to come for Christmas dinner, this symbolizes that Rose now holds the most powerful position in the family. And this is why Rose always needed Peter close to her. She knows her son would make the business a success and usher in the necessary modernization. And without ever getting his hands dirty, this is what the gloves have always symbolized a protection of the sociopathy of the corporate takeover. But for the boy, what we interpreted as sexual repression or exploration in the film was nothing more than a calculated story of revenge against the spirit of man. It was the moment a complete stranger unthinkingly used Peter's paper flower to light a cigarette and then casually extinguish it in a glass of water that the narrative was set and it did become a classic story of revenge. The purpose was made and the design of that stranger's fate was sketched out in Peter's mind and each calculated step was carefully planned in order to seal that fate. The rope symbolizes how stories are manipulated to fit our worldview or our outlook on life. At first, the stories are healthy, 
but over time, if not carefully protected, the stories can become infected and twisted. If not carefully preserved, the banal can take over the traditions, the arts, the spiritual, and the agrarian in the way that George and his indifferent attitude around the hides ended up destroying that tradition. In a way, Peter himself is a rope, weaving a narrative, whether real or not, to fit a purpose that benefits a goal. In the same way, corporations often weave stories to fit their bottom line. Peter is the new capitalist class that will replace the old bourgeois aristocracy and replace all the ways that we have connected to each other and the earth. He is foreign, distant, and repressed as the unseen power brokers that seem to control our lives often are. Peter's reptilian shape represents the corrosive, secretive, destructive nature of capitalism and its anti-human, anti-life goals. He is the deep state, the underbelly of capitalism and its ruinous form on earth. Notice he didn't attend the funeral. Why would he? He destroyed the past and gained a position of power seated firmly at the center of the ranch, which itself represents empire. He will gain more power, more influence, and destroy more land and people as he slithers in and out of the dark. He is the darkest nature of man, personified in the skinny teenage boy. Rose and George represent the feckless managerial class who only benefit from the working class. They have some education, but it's been spoon-fed to them in a one-dimensional form, and whatever achievements they claim have been handed to them in the way Phil had to handhold George throughout his education. Their liberal attitude and lack of understanding about the ways of the world or the ranch will eventually be taken over by Peter, who has already shown what he is capable of. Like all good managers, once they outlive their usefulness, they will be discarded. Phil represents freedom of choice. Despite his Ivy League education, having graduated top of his class at Yale, he chose to be a leader of men at the ranch and to tie himself to the past, to the agrarian methods of coupling with the earth. Even when he was looking over the deed to the ranch and called Rose a cheap schemer, as the managerial class often are, he knew the role expected of him was to take over empire and use his education to move into the professional class, maybe become a scholar or a lawyer. When the darker forces of the modern age and capitalism encroached in his world, that choice to remain in a humble earthbound place became a prison sentence, luring him into the trappings of the past. From the perspective of the modernized world, or even from you, the viewer, he appears to simply be reactionary and nonconformist, a bully of sorts. But he is also looked on with disdain as a relic, and yet with reverence as a romanticized notion of the past. And then there is the backdrop of the ranch itself, this mythical place representing empire, a barren place full of potential, yet seemingly discarded, remote, and almost as if it's another terrain on another planet. The isolationism is calculated in the telling of this story. There are powerful entities at play that work remotely, secretly out of reach and out of sight. There is no oversight, no scrutiny, and no regulation to keep their plans in check, no matter how devastating to the unsuspecting world it will eventually infect. <laughs>